Well, happy Earth Day, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful Earth Day wherever you might be. Uh, President Biden this week is going to slash greenhouse gas emissions. At least he's going to promise to do that at least in half by the end of the decade, according to two people briefed on the plan as part of an aggressive push to combat climate change at home and persuade other major economies around the world to follow suit. This move comes as Biden convenes a virtual summit of more than three dozen world leaders Thursday. It's a virtual summit. I mean, I assume that's COVID related. I don't know why all climate summits wouldn't be virtual if it's such a massive problem with emissions. But we're going to go and try to investigate and learn and understand all of these issues. I'm welcoming back to the program Bjorn Lomborg. He is the author of False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor and Fails to Fix the Planet. Uh, he's also the president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. Uh, Bjorn, thanks so much for coming back on the program. Hey, Steve, it's great to be back. Before we start, I want to tell everyone, if you care at all about this stuff, it's Earth Day. If you care at all about this stuff, you must own False Alarm. It is a fantastic book, and it goes through every single claim you ever hear in the media and gives you the details. So you actually can understand where they started from and what they're trying to do with them and what the truth is. And I really appreciate you putting all the time into the book. Thank you. I'm very happy for that little capsule review. It's, it's my Amazon review. Five stars uh, yes, on, on Amazon from Stu. Um, let's start with this uh, this this consensus, um, or excuse me, the uh, the, uh, the the conference they're doing virtually. Thankfully, um, it, they want to cut emissions by fifty percent in only a few years. Uh, is that even forget if it's a good idea? But is it even possible? And how would you do it? So, Stu, uh, almost everything is possible if you're just willing to pay enough. Right. Uh, and so, yes, you can go 50% uh, reduction. It's twice as much as what Obama has promised, uh, but you can definitely do it. But it will necessitate large changes. So you'll need to go to about 50% uh, renewables. You'll need to get everyone to switch over uh, to electric cars. Uh, you'll need to weatherize houses. You'll need to cut down on, on a lot of, of emission related stuff. And remember, the reason why this is a problem is because energy is the growth engine of our economy and not just of the US, but around the world. Uh, remember 200 years ago, uh, nobody had anything but their own muscle power and some wood and some draft animals. The reason why we got rich was that we had lots and lots of power. And now we're essentially saying, yeah, sure, but you can't get that from fossil fuels. You will have to pay much more in order to get that from renewables or not use it at all. This is not going to take us to the poorhouse, but it is going to be costly. But what I really think is surprising is that you know, Biden spends a lot of time telling us, oh, he's going to cut up to 52 percent. But he doesn't tell you how much will that actually achieve. Well, run it through the U.N. climate panels model and you find that this will reduce temperatures by the end of the century. So his additional promise above what Obama promised will cut temperatures by 0 0.08 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's a little good. It's also a lot of money to spend for fairly little and again, we've got to ask, could we have done that better? And the answer is yes. Yeah, and one of the things you, you talk about, I think, in a really smart way in the book, is, is the, the, the way to look at this problem and how to handle it. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, incentives for politicians to have big press conferences in front of solar panels that are available today. And that technology has really improved over the past 30 years. But instead of spending these incremental am amounts on solar panels as they develop through time. If we were doing more to do research on uh, few, uh, technologies that may become available in the future, we could solve this problem a, a lot more quickly uh, and, and, more, and more realistically uh, over the long term. Can you kind of walk yes. us through how that works? And cheaper, mm -hmm. and we could get everybody else on board. Remember, most rich, well-meaning Americans are willing to pay a couple hundred dollars to tackle climate change. Biden is suggesting let's spend, you know, $1,500 per person. Mm. That's by itself unlikely to work out in the long run. You can do that for a couple of years. You probably can't do it for 10 years. You certainly can't do it for 80 years as we need throughout the 21st century. But remember, this is only rich, well-meaning Americans. You can probably also get rich, well-meaning Europeans and some other rich people around the world. But that's still a fairly small part of the planet. It's 1.5 billion people. The rest of the planet, 
is going to emit about three quarters of all greenhouse gas emissions in the 21st century. Why? Because they're not rich, but they would like to be rich. So China, India, all the African nations, Latin America, they're not all that interested in saying, sure, let's uh, have less growth. Let's be less rich. They're unlikely to say, yay, cool, let's spend $1,500 more per person per year. For many of these nations, of course, it's money they don't even have. So the reality here is, if you try to solve global warming the way we've tried the last 30 years, by making these grand promises, as you, as you mentioned, then not keeping them, with technology that is still not efficient, we're likely to keep failing. We've certainly done that for the last 30 years. Mm. If we focused instead on innovating cheap, green, new energy. So fundamentally, that could be solar and wind. As you mentioned, they've come down dramatically, but they're still not efficient enough because basically, and this is not entirely true, but it's roughly right, you still need to hook up a lot of batteries for when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing. Mm -hmm. But it could also be fourth generation nuclear. It could be fusion, the thing that you know all science fiction novels have. It could be carbon capture. It could be all these other great ideas. Most of them, well, all of them are uncompetitive right now, but American ingenuity could make them cheaper than fossil fuels. And imagine what would happen if you could innovate just one energy source that was cheaper than fossil fuels. You wouldn't need the Biden climate summit. You wouldn't need to twist the arms of Indian leaders or uh, uh, Chinese leaders and ask them, oh, could you please cut a little more, promise to cut a little more. They would simply switch because that energy source would be cheaper. So again, we don't solve problems by telling people, I'm sorry, could you have it a little worse and continue to be a little worse off for the next 80 years? That never works. What you do, do uh, what does work is telling people, here's a great new in in invention that'll actually make your life better, that'll be cheaper, and oh, not emit CO2. I think we've had a real world example of this happening um, recently here in the United States over the past, like say 15, 20 years, where we had this conversation about incandescent light bulbs. And at the time, the, there was a big government push to convert everyone over to fluorescent bulbs because they would save energy, they would be better for the climate, and they started phasing out incandescent bulbs. Well, just a couple of years down the line were LED bulbs, which were much, much better, but so many places locked themselves in and spent money on the fluorescent bulbs as this midpoint by force when the market was there to provide a much better solution than either one of them just a couple of years later. I feel like, you know, we're, I, I feel like as a, I'm a conservative here in the United States and we're kind of told all the time that we're anti-science, but like not believing that these innovations are around the corner to me is really the anti-science view. Yes, and it's also a really bad way to solve the problem if you really care about it. I, I'm so surprised that John Kerry and many other people who allegedly really, really worry about climate uh, uh, change, they come out and say, you know, I worry so much that I'm going to recommend the same kind of policies that have failed for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. If you really worry about climate, wouldn't you want to focus on something that's actually worked? And so again, let's make sure that we don't mandate people to do stuff they don't want. Most people didn't want the compact fluorescent light bulbs. They were cheaper uh, when they ran, they were much more costly, and they often gave very bad lighting. The LEDs, as you point out, everyone buys them because they're cheap, they, they actually give really great light, and they save you a bucket load of money in the long run. That's the way to solve the problem. And other way, perhaps more clear, is if you if you take Los Angeles back in the 1950s, it was a terribly polluted place, mostly because of of cars. Uh, and and you know the standard sort of John Kerry approach to solving this problem would be to go to everyone in Los Angeles and say, I'm sorry, could you just uh, you know bike instead or run or walk or something? And of course that's not going to work. Yeah. What did work? was the innovation of the catalytic converter in 1974. Yeah, it costs some money. You put it on your, uh, uh, your exhaust pipe and you're done. You can drive much longer and pollute a lot less. That's the way you solve problems. And of course, that's why Los Angeles is today a much, much cleaner place. Look, it doesn't solve everything, but it solved a big problem 
without telling people, could you do with less? Mm. And that's, I think, fundamentally what you do over and over again when looking at these things is actually applying a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, so often, I feel like there's just a benefit analysis. Like, we say we should do these things because it will improve X, Y, and Z in the future. But the cost is an incredible uh, part of that. And it's not just money. It's opportunity cost. You know, I mean, yeah. putting in old solar panels that are inefficient locks you in. You spend money that you could have spent uh, furthering the technology and making those panels better in the future. It, I, it's, it's just difficult to see how politicians are going to come around to, to this sort of thinking because it might solve the problem. But in reality, it doesn't do any good for their their careers right at this moment. And, and you're right that it is harder to get politicians to do this. But I think both Biden is actually, and to his credit, is saying that this is also what he wants. Of course, he has sort of, we should do everything. So right. even the smart stuff is on, on his list. Uh, but also a lot of conservatives are saying we should be spending this. And of course, the benefit to politicians is to say, if we spend money smartly on innovation, that means we don't spend, you know, we, we'll spend maybe $30 billion instead of $300 billion or instead of, you know, a half a trillion dollars. So we can save a lot of money that we can spend on all these other things that we would like to do, like cut people's taxes or give them better opportunity or better infrastructure and all these other things. So I think there is a real upside to say, look, let's try to make climate change not a trillion dollar problem, which will inevitably mean that uh, that voters are eventually going to be turned off and just unelect those uh, those politicians who keep giving them trillion dollar bills uh, uh, or pay. Bills has a <laughs> double meaning in American, right? Uh, but you have to pay all this money. Whereas the politicians who say, I'm going to make it into a $30 billion problem, I'm going to spend it smartly, and then I'm going to leave you with all these other benefits uh, that we can either spend uh, uh, publicly or just give you back in your taxes, that would be a winner, I would imagine. Hmm. One of the big complaints you hear from, uh, from people who are alarmist on this is it's going to cost us gigantic amounts of money if we don't fix this problem. And you talk about it. I mean, it is a lot of money. It's a couple percent of GDP, which adds up to an awful lot of money. Money. But it, it seems like, again, like that is only part of the package. It doesn't take into account the good things that will happen over that term. Can you walk people through that? Yeah. So so fundamentally, it is correct. Global warming is a problem. Uh, so the world's only climate economist to get the Nobel Prize in climate economics, uh, William Nordhaus, has tried to and he's built a whole uh, literature together with uh, dozens of other researchers. And this is what the UN Climate Panel tells us in their latest report. The likely outcome is that if we do nothing about climate, it'll probably cost somewhere between three and four percent of global GDP by the end of the century. That's a not trivial cost. Remember, by then, the UN estimate will be about 450 percent as rich as what we are today. So instead of being 450 percent as rich, we'll be 436 percent as rich. Mm. That tells us two things. First of all, it's still going to be a much, much better world, but it could have been an even better world. That sort of gives, uh, you know, that puts in perspective when people tell you this is an existential crisis. No, it's not. It's a problem. It's not the end of the world. The second part of this, of course, is to recognize if you spend, say, one or two percent of GDP to solve the whole problem, you made a good deal. You spent a couple of percent, you save four percent. That's great. But unfortunately, that's not typically what people are suggesting. They're rather saying, let's spend five, 10 percent to solve a small part of the problem. And that's a little bit like, you know, curing your wrist ache by cutting off your arm. That is a bad deal. So again, we need to remember, we both have to pay climate damages, but we also have to pay climate policy damages. So we should make sure that the sum of those two is the smallest we can do. And that's, of course, what he got the Nobel Prize for. And there's a very smart answer for that. You should cut some, but not too much. And unfortunately, most of the rich world is talking about cutting way too much. Yeah, and this is, I know, a lot of the work you do at the Copenhagen Consensus Center as well. Um, I want to hit one more thing, though, because this is Earth Day. This is a global, a global thing. Um, we in the United States, uh, the debate is always seemingly about the same thing. People who don't, you know, you either care about money and that's all you care about and you're a conservative and you don't care about the earth. Or on the other side, you uh, want to cut emissions because you care and you actually care about the planet. 
However, globally, the, the issue is, is different than that. And, and you point this out in the book. You talk about how when we are giving, let's say, aid to a poorer country, um, we oftentimes attach these sort of green policies to, as a condition of getting that money. And you call it a, a, a different kind of imperialism, which I thought was a really interesting way of thinking about this. These policies harm these countries and they're completely unfair to them. Well, yes, they they help them very little. So look, when people try to do good, they end up probably doing a little good. But if you could have done a lot more good, have you really done well? Right. So, you know, for instance, for, for most of the developing countries, for most of the world's poor, they have much bigger environmental problems. So the by far the biggest environmental problem is indoor and outdoor air pollution. Uh, and then it's water and sanitation, it's uh, radon, and yes, it's also global warming, but very, very far down the list. So again, if you want it to help them with environmental issues, you should help them with indoor and outdoor air pollution. Indoor is by far the most ef effective and cheapest way to help them, and it's something that most people just even don't think about. It's the fact that almost three billion people cook and keep warm with dirty fuels like dung, cardboard, and wood. They cook inside, they, keep the, uh, they heat their huts uh, with, uh, with dung, and not surprisingly, it's about 10 times as polluted as Beijing is when it's worst in their outdoor air pollution. So this means that you know, 3 billion people smoke what is the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes every day. Clearly, that is something we should do something about. And that's mostly about lifting these people out of poverty. But also remember, environment is only one of the many problems that poor people have. They care about the fact that their kids die from easily curable infectious diseases. They don't have enough food for their kids. They don't get a good education. There are all these other things that they care about that we can also help with. So, you know, for instance, uh, immunizing their kids. It's about making sure that their kids get good food. Uh, that'll also help them in school. There are many, many other ways where you can spend a dollar and do so much more good. And that's why I'm a little surprised when people say, which they will say about Earth Day and about global warming, this is about helping the world's poor. That somehow we've gotten it into our mind to say the way to help the world's poor is by me not driving to work tomorrow. What? <laughs> no, the way to help the world's poor is by getting them immunization, by getting them food, by getting them access to our market so that they can produce, so they can get people out of poverty. And yes, we should also fix climate change, but it's pretty far down the list. And we should do so smartly by innovating so that they also get the benefit of great access to cheap and abundant energy but eventually without the CO2. Hi, Stu Bergier of Stu Does America here. Thanks so much for watching our video. Did you know you could watch our entire catalog for free right here on our channel? Subscribe now and be sure to hit the thumbs up button on all the episodes you watch because that's how they know you like this stupid show. And that little bell in the corner as well. Make sure you click that. You'll get notifications every time we post new content. Stu Does America every weekday at 8 p.m. Eastern right here.